Good morning, everybody. I hope your weekend was at least average, right? They can't all be excellent, and some of them are bad, but, you know, go for the solid C+. Um, let's see. Tomorrow we have a lab, a real lab. You should have that lab lab. It's on standing weight. You're going to be making standing weights in lab, right? So go over it. It's, um, you can have like three different types of string. You kind of just want to be familiar basically again with what's going to happen in the lab. You, don't, you won't understand everything exactly because you won't have the stuff in front of you to see it. But if you're familiar with what's going to happen, the lab will go easier and faster for you. Uh, let's see, a week from tomorrow, what's happening? Your first exam. Uh, right? So the cover chapters, whatever they are, 15, 16, 17. Okay. Um, all of this harmonic motion, waves, and then the sound stuff that we've got going here. I have the roll sheet that we marked off. Uh, oh, uh, GRASP. Uh, we had a really good problem this Friday in GRASP. Um, we're running out of room <laughs> for the number of people that want to come into GRASP. So we're moving the GRASP room to this room. Don't worry, come to grasp. We'll have a sign on the door. It'll be locked, it'll be obvious, but you'll hear a lot of screaming in front coming from this room instead of that room. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be in here. We'll move the desks around so that you know it's it's group work and all that kind of stuff. But uh, just letting you know, and I'll put a I'll put a thing up on Canvas, an, an announcement, both the big canvas announcement and the one in class about switching grasp around. Um, the other thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, disease and <laughs> sickness. Uh, I've had a lot of people email me either with positive or negative COVID results, just have a cold, have the flu, whatever, right? Um, just, um, you know, be careful, right? Uh, if you're showing symptoms, stay home, right? Whether it's COVID or not, it's up to you. Cold's a cold, flu's a flu, but uh, we don't want to expose people unnecessarily. Uh, wear a mask, right, if you're worried about getting those uh, diseases. In our family, it's really bad if we get a flu, so we try to try to avoid those things. Pre, Pre-pandemic, we always just used to hide, <laughs> right? Now we get to wear masks everywhere. So anyway, just, just, just so you're aware, like the, the students in your class have been emailing me with all of these various um, diseases, and I just wanted to just keep you aware, right? Um, it is still flu season. We're still in the wintertime. And we want to be as careful as we can. We were doing sound waves, and I think we talked about the speed of sound. I probably didn't show you this. I don't remember showing you this. It's not important. I mean, if you really want to know the speed of sound in carbon tetrachloride, there it is. The point is, the speed of a wave depends on the medium in which it's traveling, right? The material in which it's traveling. And so, change the material and you change the speed. But what is important is that we are going to model sound as coming from a point source and that the sound energy, the waves, everything will radiate out in three dimensions as spheres. But we need to talk about sort of how the whole system of sound in terms of human perception works. Um, I'm, I'm never going to quiz you on the biology of the ear. Um, I am not a biologist or a doctor, so what I'm about to say is probably not true, but it's cool anyway. What are these flappy things on the side of your head for? Earwax. Earwax? Wind. <laughs> Collecting <laughs> flying. Um, let's do an experiment. Okay? And I want you to show. Because these flappy things on the outside of your ear are not your ears. Right? Your ear technically is most of the stuff that's inside your head. Okay? So what are the flappy things for? What I want you to do right now is take both of your hands and I want you to cup your hands behind your ears. You kind of want to make the flappy things bigger. And I want you, I'm going to keep up a sort of a constant stream of uniform sound here. And what I want you to do is take your hands off of your ears and put your hands back on your ears and just kind of go back and forth as I give this constant volume, constant tone kind of sound, did you hear any difference? What happened when you did this? It got louder? Maybe even a little bit clearer? Okay, same thing. 
I'll try to keep up the same sort of monotone sound, right? But what I want you to do this time is pin your ears to the back of your head, right? Just sort of push them in and do the, con do the experiment between having to listen with your ears pinned back versus your ears not pinned back, right? And listen to the sound of my voice and how it changes when you have them pinned versus not pinned. <sighs> what was the difference? It got like muddier. Like maybe not the volume change, but it like almost muffled, like almost like maybe there was a little bit of a covering over your ears, right? So there's some experiments, right, for what these flappy cartilaginous structures are doing on the side of your head. They're for sound wave collection. Our evolution has got us to the point where these flappy things can collect the sound and channel it into the parts of our ear that are really doing all the work. So let's talk about the ear canal. What should not be put in your ear canal? There is actually, there was a variety of answers there. There is an actual medical definition for this. Anything bigger than your elbow. It's anything bigger than your elbow. Small. Smaller. smaller than your elbow. Yeah, bigger than that. Yeah. Anything smaller than your elbow. That's what's in the American Medical Association guidelines for the size of object that should be in the human ear, not counting doctor's instruments, okay? So, as soon as I read that, I was, I, the picture that got in my head was a bunch of patients, right? The point is, if it's any smaller than this, don't get it near your ear. So a Q-tip should go where? Anywhere except in there, right? So be careful, right? Q-tip's great for cleaning the flappy thing, right? But what happens if you stick it too far in? You risk damaging the structures that are in there, namely the eardrum, but you also are probably compacting all of the gooey waxy stuff that's in there, okay, which is there to lubricate your ear canal. Ear canals are pretty fascinating because you can make somebody throw up by putting cold water in their ear canals. You know that? The favorite thing to do in medical school is squirt cold water in the person's ear next to you because they'll instantly get nauseated. Why? Your ear canal needs to be at a very specific temperature, body temperature. And if it isn't, it starts to go out of whack. And when your ear canal starts to go out of whack, it starts throwing off the rest of the system, namely the snail that lives in your head. Okay? It's called a cochlea. Right? But it's, it looks like a snail, doesn't it? Okay? Inside that cochlea, there is fluid. And part of what the cochlea does is tell your body where your head is in space. Do you see the semicircular canals that are up there? Kind of make up the snail's head and antenna, right? Okay? Those are actually, we've evolved to put them along three spatial axes. And if you close your eyes and you move your head, like just tilt your neck side to side, back and forth, and push it forward and backward in space, you can get a sense that your head has moved. And the reason you get that sense is because of the fluid that's in your ear. Well, if you squirt cold water into your ear, the ear canal freaks out, which makes the snail freak out. And if the snail's freaking out, there's only one response that the body has to that, and it's called motion sickness. When your body is confused, about what your semicircular canals are telling you versus what it's seeing happening. There is one assumption that the body makes. Why do people throw up when they have motion sickness or like get nauseated? Their brain is what? The brain assumes you've been poisoned. Throwing up is the body's let's get it all out mechanism. And so your body will interpret mixed signals from its, what is that called, the vestibular system that's responsible for all of the knowing how to, where everything is. No, that's not vestibular. What is that? Proprioception, that's the one that's in your feet. I don't remember any of my big words anymore. When your body's confused about what's going on, it will just simply assume you were poisoned. And you will start throwing up and throw up out of the opposite end, right? Like it's... It just tries to get rid of everything, okay? Because it assumes you've ingested something that's very bad. 
Okay? When in fact, all you've done is move your head in space while the boat has done something else. Right? Again, mix up of signals. So yeah, don't squirt cold air in your ear canal. <laughs> Make sure it's warm before it goes in there. Um, don't put water in your ear unless you know what you're doing. Um, but this system, right? So this, back to the physics. The sound waves get collected by the flappy bits. I'm sure have a name, but I've forgotten at this point from my anatomy of the biology class that I dropped within one week. Sound gets collected, channeled into the ear canal, where it hits the eardrum. And what does the eardrum do? It vibrates. So remember, sound is a bunch of these longitudinal waves. And so as those pressure waves impact the eardrum, the eardrum begins to bounce back and forth. But the eardrum itself, that's a very tiny wiggle. It's like that, right? And it needs amplification. And so our ears have evolved with the auditory bones, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, right? To those three bones, their shape and, and how they're just barely connected to each other, act as a natural amplifier for that vibration. Increasing that vibration and then channeling it into the cochlea. Inside the cochlea is a, um, a series of uh, cilia. These are, these are hairs that grow out of the walls of the cochlea, and they have different lengths, and they're inside of this fluid. And as the sound gets transferred into the cochlea, it starts moving through the fluid of the cochlea. The sound waves, the individual frequencies that make up those sound waves, cause different cilia to resonate. The length of that little hair corresponds to a certain frequency. When that cilia gets wiggled and starts to resonate with the sound waves that are being channeled into the cochlea, there's a little nerve ending on the end of that cilia that fires and goes to your brain and says, you heard something. And what you heard was this frequency. The longer the cilia, they're not that long. <laughs> These are tiny, tiny structures, right? The longer the cilia, the lower its resonance frequency, and thus the lower the note. How long does it take humans to learn how to speak whatever language their culture has? I'm still learning, Mr. Raylo. Right? Like, there's cultural things. I'm talking about the actual mechanism that, like, at what age would you say, like, a baby, toddler, child actually can, like, speak decently? Two and a half, five, right? It, it's definitely not all born speaking, right? There is, there is this process that has to take place. And so in a normally functioning infant ear brain connection, right, they have to, they're hearing the sounds, but they aren't connecting meaning to those sounds, right? There's a collection of frequencies that are being sent to the brain, and it takes three to five to 48 years to figure out what that collection of sounds, I'm trying to learn Spanish, it's just like doing it all over again, right? And it's just like, it takes a while, doesn't it? To train the brain how to know what that collection of sounds is. There are several things that happen to human beings when they have children. Okay? This is not that time. <laughs> One of the things that is universally true about humans, it doesn't matter what culture you're in or anything like that, okay? if you give an infant to an adult to hold for any length of time, that adult becomes instantly stupid. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? What happens when you have a baby? <laughs> what happened to the language processing of that adult? It's creepy. I'm telling you, this is cross-cultural. It doesn't matter, right? You know, like, what is going on? What is, what, is, what in our programming is making us do that? I get a baby, I just start talking quantum mechanics. <laughs> it instantly shuts them up. 
because it's not just another dumb, right? And the kids just like change my diaper, right? And then they'll do, right? So I just start talking quantum. It completely confuses them. I see it happen in 21 year olds all the time, right? And they shut up. Or maybe they understand better than we do. What's happened? Why do adults do that? What is it in our genetics that drives us to do that? What are we trying to give that child? There's no language there. It's nonsense. What did my voice just do? It fluctuated through the entire range of human frequencies that we are capable. When adults talk to each other, do we do that? No. <laughs> We're talking about physics. It's, like, it's all this one tone, right? You get excited about something, we'll start to kind of modulate the frequencies, but we don't talk about, hey, dude. Hey, dude. If you did that, somebody would slap you. Right? <laughs> or call the cops or something, right? Like, we talk sort of normal range of frequencies. You give an adult a baby and they'll instantly start going through their entire vocal range. The adult will swear that they never sing. You give them a baby, they start singing. It may not be music, it may not be a lullaby, but they're taking their voice through that range so that the child starts to know, right? what those frequencies are, it can start connecting them to the brain. It takes a lot, it three years, 48 years to figure out what those sounds mean and how they get there and all that kind of stuff. When it goes wrong, when you have problems, right, you start having speech impediments or hearing loss or any of those kinds of things. And the system is very complicated, but there's a certain category of hearing loss that we can fix now. I am telling you, we are living in Star Trek, okay? So if somebody has a problem with their cochlea, with the way that the cilia function, or maybe the cilia have been damaged in an accident, uh, exposed to too loud of a sound, the cilia can be overdriven by loud sounds and they'll stop to resonate, in, in a sense they'll break. Um, or a birth defect, right, has left the cochlea unable to have the physical connection between the sound waves and the nerve endings, a person could get something called a cochlear implant. There's a piece that looks like a hearing aid that hangs over the ear um, that is designed, that's the computer that is pulling in the sound waves, listening for that person's ear. But then there's the part that sort of plugs into a port on their head, okay, that has a transducer that's inserted surgically into their cochlea that takes the place of the cilia and can activate the nerve endings in their cochlea, which are still there, which are fine, the nerve endings are okay. It's the cilia that need fixing. And so these people can hear again, or in some cases, hear for the first time. I read a wonderful article once, and the title of the article was My Bionic Quest for Bolero. Bolero is a piece of classical music that is absolutely like, if you get into what the piece Bolero and, and its musical progression and frequencies, and the, anyway, the person that wrote it is either genius or madman, okay? It is, a, it is a haunting piece of music, and it does stuff to your brain that is amazing, okay? It, he wrote about how he had hearing loss. He used to listen to Bolero, his favorite piece of music, and then he lost the ability to hear, so he couldn't hear music at all. And over the decades, as cochlear implants got better and better and better, over 30 decades, he chronicled, like the first ones that they got were like one frequency only. Now, human voice has a lot of frequencies in it, but we tend to be in a very narrow range of frequencies when we talk. And so they would program the implant to, own, you know, to, to really just try to hit the average of a human voice. And then, like his next implant was able to do four different frequencies. And then the next one was able to do 64, is always a multiple of the, of the binary, right? 
and he chronicled how he went from being able to hear one note in Valero. Imagine that, this music, piece of music that lasts for like 15 minutes, right? And he could only ever hear like one note when, it, when that frequency was hit by the music until the modern day when he was able to, you know, the, the device was able to discretize between tens of thousands of frequencies, right? But you know, It's incredible. I'll share a clip here. This is a clip of a woman being fitted for, so she's had her implant put in, okay? And post-surgery, when you're all recovered, they will then fit the outer part for the first time and sort of initialize it and bring the system online. So she, she hasn't been able to hear since she was a little girl. She can speak a little bit. She went on to say that you know she heard her husband's voice for the first time, right after having her implant. Like just <laughs> human beings are awesome. We really are. We're jerks and a holes and everything else, but we are awesome, right? We can solve these problems. Go watch videos of blind children running around the playground, wearing glasses that feed audio input into their ears so that they can navigate around obstacles with like sonar in real time. They can't see, but they can play tag. Just amazing. So let's start unraveling, right, the basics of understanding how sound works. <coughs> It's really just pivotal for our existence, the way we communicate, how we use sound, what we do. And we're really going to divide chapter 17 in sort of three big categories. We want to talk about sound intensity, how loud and soft sounds are, and how we deal with that. We're going to do something called the Doppler effect, which is how sound frequencies change based on relative motion. And then we're going to get into really kind of musical sounds and what it means for, for what is music and how does the orchestra function? And we're going to take a very um, European, Western European uh, approach to it. Um, but I'll try and hit some of the other cultures as we're in there and the, the similarities and differences. So sound intensity. So this is, I think, the first time in your Physics 4 ABC career where we really define what intensity is. And this this works everywhere. This isn't just for sound. Intensity by definition, so we would use three bars, but I, I don't ever like doing that, is the amount of power that's delivered divided by the cross-sectional area that that power is focused on. So when we talk about the intensity of sound, there is a power, an energy per time. Does anybody remember what the units of power are? Watts, okay, and the units of area, meter squared or a square meter, right? We talk about the amount of energy per time, the wattage that a sound is making, divided by the cross-sectional area that that sound is focused onto. As the sound of my voice moves through this room, it starts here and spreads out as a series of spherical wavefronts, right? And so the power that I'm generating with the 
shape of my head and where I hold my tongue and my vocal cords and all those kinds of things. As that is emitted into the room, the power starts getting spread over the area that that spherical wavefront is traveling over. There's a set amount of power, and then it spreads out of that area. And so if we're modeling this as, a, as spherical wavefronts, then one way to do the intensity of a sound wave would be take its power and divide by the surface area oops, of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. And so you'll see the 4 pi r squared quite often. Technically, intensity is power divided by area, but it's when we're modeling sound or light or any of the other ways we're going to deal with this semester, what we're talking about is we're simplifying down this idea that it's a isotropic source, meaning it's a point source, and then that wave is expanding out spherically. We know the surface area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. So really, the intensity equation is an inverse square law, which you have run into before. 4B students are not dying inside. The 4A students, you encountered it with gravity. Okay. So for somebody that's sitting up here that's only a meter away from me, they hear a certain intensity of sound. But if somebody is 4 meters away from me, how much quieter, less intense, is the sound? First of all, I know it's less. Why? The distance is bigger, and so I'm making the denominator bigger, right? So my intensity is going down. But if, if I quadruple the distance, we go from one meter to four meter, how many times softer is that sound? 16, 16 times softer. So people in the front row are going deaf, but people in the back row can't hear me. Because if you're five meters away, how are you doing back there in the nosebleed section? How, le how much less intense is the sound? 25 times. Why do I shout? <laughs> right? Because I've got to get the energy back there, right? And of course, I can go to artificial forms of amplification with microphones and speakers and all that kind of stuff, but the room is epic. All right. I used to lecture in a 300 seat lecture hall. Um, at uh, BYU, and uh, I never used a microphone there either. I can fill a space with my voice. All right. So that seems like a really incredible range, right? Of sound, like 25 times less back there. But when it comes to human hearing, there is a threshold below which our ears cannot register sound. There is a bottom floor to the intensity of sound that our ears can hear. This reference intensity, I not, is measured and defined as 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So we're going to use this reference intensity quite a bit. We, we basically calibrate all of our intensity scale to this number. Okay? 1 times 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. That, what is that? Very small. Very small. That is a trillionth of a watt per square meter. So, so we go, we go, let's see, we go, we go, we go milli, micro, nano is 10 to the minus 9. Does anybody know 10 to the minus 12? Pico. Pico got nerd on there. That's good. Okay. Pico, this is pico watts per square meter, right? What is the, what is the softest, least intensity sound that a human being can hear? Like, what's an example of the softest sound? I asked an acoustical physicist once, where do you get this number? Like, like I understand, like, sort of mathematically where you get it. You get it out of lots of measurement of human hearing and all that kind of stuff. But, like... What, what example can I use for my students? And she looked at me and she said, well, try this one. I thought this was going bad, but just, just, just wait for it. She said, if you are alone in a forest, I was like, you're going to tell a really bad joke, aren't you? 
no, 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 no. If you are alone on the farm and there's no wind and the forest is quiet and it's fall and the leaves right are falling off of the trees. So I've got I've already got this picture of oh, relax now, right? He said if a leaf falls off of a tree and strikes the ground one meter from your ear. So now I've got a picture of me like leaning down, right, trying to get a meter from a fallen leaf, right? The leaf striking the forest floor one meter from your ear is the threshold of sensation. That would be the, an example of the softest sound. Let's clear up something else. If a tree falls in the forest <laughs> and there's nobody around, does it still make a sound? Yes. Yes. yes, because sound is vibration and that tree is going to vibrate something. Right? Okay. The glass with water halfway up, half empty or half full? It's always full. It's always empty. Solid matter is 99.99% .99 empty space. See what's there, not what other people tell you to see. And as my wife is apt to point out, if a man is alone in a forest and there's no women around, is he still wrong? <laughs> Don't answer. Don't answer. All right. That's the threshold of intensity. Okay. Is there an upper limit? Is there a sound so loud that you can't hear it? Okay, this is human perception. We're not talking about dogs. Right? Not frequency, we're talking about intensity. The loudness of a sound. I mean, if you go deaf, wouldn't you know what I'm Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you blow your ears up, right? Is that possible? Can sounds be so loud that they cause damage to human hearing? Yes. Absolutely. And so, by definition, again, after a lot of evidence and measurement and all that kind of stuff, one watt per square meter is referred to as the threshold of pain. <laughs> we have to say it like that. Okay? It's written in the books, it's just the threshold of pain. Come on. It should be called the threshold of pain. Right? One watt per square meter, that measured value, is when a human being will report discomfort in the ear, pain in the ear because of the sound that they heard. If you don't have ear protection, a person will often, at this intensity and above, work to alleviate the intensity by covering their ears, um, turning away, okay? That's, that's what this is, okay? Um, how, how much of a range is there between being barely able to hear something and going out a trillion. There's there's twelve powers of ten in that range. This is a huge range, and it can be difficult to deal with all of those zeros. And so, what have scientists done? Yes. No, they just made it harder so that we didn't have to deal with all the powers of ten by introducing a logarithmic scale. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the decibel? Okay, the decibel is a unit of intensity, sound intensity, that instead of having to deal with a trillion <laughs> powers of 10, not trillion powers of 10, but, but 10 to the 12 on the scale of human hearing, instead brings it down to a scale that exists between zero and some higher number. Get to that higher number in a second. 
But I want you to understand that when we go to define the decibel, that's the, that's the Greek letter capital beta, this equation that I am giving you, and this is log base 10, by the way, this equation right here, which is kind of the definition of the decibel, is a conversion equation. So back in chapter 1, you learned about conversion factors, right? So many feet equals a meter, blah, 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 right? And you can just do the multiply by the fractions and you can, you can convert between units. This is that next level. We've leveled up, okay? Rather than just having a straight number conversion back and forth, we have to pass it through a function. So if we want to find how many decibels, one watt, or the, the reference intensity here, Okay, 1 times 10 to the minus 12. We put in 1 times 10 to the minus 12 in for the i. We divide by 1 times 10 to the minus 12 because i naught's in there, right? And what do you get when you divide i naught by i naught? You get 1, right? And what's log base 10 of 1? Zero. 0. So 0 decibels represents what? The threshold of human hearing. So it's scaled, right? So that this is zero and the symbol is a, a, a little lowercase d times the beta, right? Decibels. The deci is because there's a factor of 10 in the front. Don't worry about that. It's just historical. What, how would we calculate the, the threshold, of, threshold of pain? We put in 1 divided by 10 to the minus 12. What's 1 divided by 10 to the minus 12? 10 to the 12. It's 10 to the 12. And what's log base 10 of 10 to the 12? What does this logarithmic thing do? It pulls the power of 10 off, right? A log base 10 and a power of 10 cancel each other out so that you just get 12, right? And then you multiply that by 10, and what do you get? 120. So 120 decibels is the threat threshold of pain. Hey, if uh, the leaf on a forest floor is the threshold for what you hear, is there is there a comparable sound to the threshold of pain? Like, there... Yeah. So it's it's a really good question. Justin's asking what what's 120 decibel sound like? What's an example of that? So. Um, Here's some, here's some sounds for you, okay, uh, on the decibel scale, right? So we got threshold of hearing. Interesting, rustling leaves. So these would be leaves, several leaves, right, okay, on the forest floor. Um, notice that a normal conversation is happening around how many decibels? 60. 60. Is my boy 60 decibels right now? No. Absolutely not. I've got to get it into the far corner back there, right? But... I mean, let's be real. I do know that I'm causing you pain of the mental and maybe emotional kind. But in terms of like your hearing, you're not sitting there having to cover your ears, right? So there's no way that I'm reaching 120 decibels of sound with you, right? So maybe I'm more like busy traffic or a lawnmower, right? <coughs> Sirens. <coughs> are designed to put out really loud noises. Why? <laughs> you want people to know that it's coming, okay? Or that the end of the world is happening. Whatever the siren is attached to, okay? You want to let people know that it's going on. And so they tend to be very, very loud. When the fire alarms go off nowadays in most modern buildings, you'll watch people scurrying out of the building covering their ears because it's that loud, right? Um, but by design. So, rock concerts, musical concerts in general, they'll often exceed 140 decibels of sound output at the speaker. But the speakers are typically more than two meters away from the closest person to get to them. Okay? So, even though the sound output is 140 decibels at the speaker, it falls off, right? It's an inverse square law. But unfortunately, now it's a log movement scale, so we've got to deal with that. 
prolonged exposure to 100 decibel sounds can have the same physiological effect as an instantaneous exposure at, say, 140 decibels. You can end up with exactly the same damage to your ear. Which is why modern smartphones, if you wear earbuds and things like that, will often warn you if you've been listening to the volume turned up all the way for a prolonged period of time. Okay? They're trying to protect your ear health because those earbuds can reach about 100 decibels. Uh, if you're like Van Gogh. <laughs> if you're what? If you're, if you're like in band. Yeah. You, you're, just... you're sitting in front of the trumpet section? Oh, uh, I was a... Uh, I was a... Uh, well, I switched anywhere between the low brass, so yeah, my hearing started to screw. Yeah, yeah, running, yeah. So. Okay, those, are, those, those instruments will pump out 130, 140 decibels at the, at the bell. Okay, and the clarinetists had to sit in front of the trumpet. Right? There's some orchestras that put a plexiglass shield in front of, between the trumpet and the rest of the orchestra. Because they're loud. Is there also a difference in the frequency and the damage of your ears? So. I'm not paying these guys to ask these questions. I've just <laughs> anticipated them on my slides, okay? So this is the kind of graph that you might see if you ask for the data from your uh, hearing test, if you ever go to the doctor for a hearing test. What they'll do is they'll put you in a, in a special chamber that tries to like knock out all sound, and then they'll play some tones through like a headset, okay? And you'll, you'll hear left, they're testing left and right, but then you'll hear low frequencies and high frequency tones, right? What they're doing is they're mapping this white bubble. They're trying to find the edge of the white bubble. What, what's going on here? Notice the frequencies down here and the decibel levels over here. What this is trying to tell us is that when the frequency is down at 20 hertz, which is typically considered to be like the lowest frequency that the human ear can hear, you actually need that sound to be at the threshold of pain in order for a person to hear it. Okay? So it needs to have a really high intensity at that low frequency for us to pick it up. And notice there is like this, it's a kind of bowl shape, right? As the frequency goes up and you're sitting right here in the kilohertz range, we actually don't need very much sound intensity to be able to hear it. Right? So our ear, so, so a hearing test is designed to find out what your bubble looks like. It's flat on top, why? That's the threshold of pain, right? But you're trying to map everything else that's below it. And notice, notice where human speech conversation sits. Right smack dab in the middle. What have we evolved for? Being able to communicate with each other, which seems like Congress is incapable of. <laughs> Let's go back to this sound intensity. In many ways, physics 4C really begins to connect the physics that we've been learning to like real things that impact real people in real ways, right? Um, which is why this class, a lot of times the students come out, this is my favorite of the three, right? Because I feel like there's just really, something's actually happening now, right? We're not just sliding penguins down icy hills, right? <laughs> We're actually getting to the, to the meat. All right, so um, one thing to have in your back pocket is kind of the reverse. So we can, go from, we can go from watts per square meter to decibels. It's nice to be able to go from decibels to watts per square meter also, right, to be able to reverse this. So let's do this once so we don't have to ever do it again. How do I solve that equation in that lower box for intensity? First step, get divided by 10. So we got beta over, uh, we'll do it in red, we'll do it in green. Beta over 10 equals log. Okay, so how do I get rid of a log? Raise it to, make it into a power of 10. So 10 to the log of something is something. A log to the 10 of something is a something, right? They cancel each other out. So if I, if I say that the left-hand side is now a power of 10, and I say the right hand, I got, what I do on the left, I got to do on the right, is a power of 10. 
that I have 10 to the beta over 10 equals, and what's 10 to the log of something? It's the something, which means that my intensity in watts per square meter will be the reference intensity times 10 to whatever my decibel measurement is divided by 10. And there you go. The, the two lower boxes, the ones in the middle of the screen, those are the equations that you use to get back and forth between watts per square meter and decibels. Why would you ever want to do that? Why not just live in watts per square meter? The answer is all of the acoustical physicists and acoustical engineers all live in decibels. They have for a long time, and they will continue to do so, and we can't convince them otherwise. I don't mind having lots of you know, ex scientific notation around, but apparently in the field of acoustics, they do. What's more, there seems to be like three different decibel scales out there. They're all logarithmic. They all are based on the thresholds of hearing for humans. But if you've ever worked with audio equipment that goes from negative decibels to zero to positive decibels, and some of you out there are kind of nodding, going, oh, yeah, I've seen something like that, right? Or you change the volume on, say, an amplifier, and it tells negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. What they've done is they've moved zero to a different, it's called the reference intensity or something like that, where anything above it's considered high, anything below it's considered low, but they want to hit like a certain sound level for whatever recording they're doing or whatever performance is being happened. In engineering and physics, in STEM fields, we go from zero up. There's, it's just always positive decibels. We will never use, I'm just warning you, you will see online, you'll see in certain situations, if you ever have to work with sound equipment, you might see scales that start at like negative 100 and go up to zero and then might top out at say 30, right? What they're doing is they're playing around with where they want sort of the, the normal amount of sound intensity to be, and then every other sound is a measurement in comparison to that normalized value. And I can't remember what the third one is, it's really weird. Um, but anyway. I had, I've had plenty of fun conversations with uh, audio engineers about the absolute mysticism that they commit okay, when working with sounds, especially like in, in movies and stuff like that. The Foley artists and the sound engineers and all that sort of stuff is absolutely incredible how they trick our brains. All right, so um, some takeaways from this, and I'll do an example. Sound at. You have two sources of sound with intensities. Their intensities add together in watts per square meter, not in decibels. So if you have a 10 decibel sound and you have another 10 decibel sound, you do not get a 20 decibel sound. Logarithmic scales are screwy. Our brains really don't know how to deal with them. For example, if, I'm, if I have a 30 decibel sound, and then a, I expose you to a 40 decibel sound, how many times more powerful is the 40 decibel sound compared to the 30? It's 10 times. A jump of 30 to 40 on the decibel scale represents a 10-fold increase in intensity. So what about comparing a 30 decibel sound to a 50 decibel sound? That's a hundred times more powerful. What about from 30 decibels to 60 decibels? That's a thousand. Every jump of 10 on the scale is a factor of 10 multiplier. So what about when you go from 50 to 60 decibels? That's 10 again. The 60 decibel sound is 10 times higher than the 50 decibel sound. The other thing to catch there is that power is always the same. Power is energy per time, and energy must be conserved. 
So if I'm putting out 50 watts of acoustical energy, the people in the front and the people in the back are both getting 50 watts. Intensity factors in the distance, right? Intensity is what drops off. The power stays the same. So if something's at a higher frequency, does that mean that the same decibel rating of a higher frequency is going to contain more energy than a lower frequency? That's what I was actually going to ask. Well, the reason I ask is because I had an audio engineer tell me that lower frequency sound at higher volume Okay, your question was about energy. <laughs> now I want to hide now because the answer is very complicated, so I'm just going to lie. Yes. What you're driving at is how to damage a human ear. That's different. That actually has, has something to do with power and energy, but our ears get damaged differently depending on what the frequencies are. Well, the whole point of a dog whistle is to produce a frequency we can't hear. Yeah, but uh, I guess. Okay. Would you guys, maybe we're very young, there was this fad where you could get a ringtone yeah. that apparently your parents couldn't hear? Do <laughs> <laughs> you remember this? Yeah. Right? The idea was is that old people can't hear anymore. Right? And that's what happens. You're, you're the, the, we can hear, like, we can go up about 20,000 hertz. It's different for different people, but about 20,000 hertz you can't hear anymore. And um, maybe tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to bring out some demo equipment. We're going to do some audio stuff in the, in, in the lab. But um, if I can get it to work, I'll get a frequency generator going, and we'll, we'll test everybody's hearing, OK? But um, there's like this cutoff of 20,000 hertz. Now, for younger people, it's like 22,000 hertz. And then for people over 50, it's like 18,000 hertz. Like, as you get older, the cilia stop working as well, and all like, a bunch of things that stop working as well. Um, but <laughs> You start losing the ability to hear these high frequencies. Well, the fad was, put this ringtone on, your parents will never be able to hear your phone ringing. The ringtones were supposed to generate like a frequency above 22,000 hertz, which is really pushing it. Less than 1% of the human population can hear above 22,000 hertz. The problem was is that phones, even nowadays, the speakers on phones are incapable of that frequency. They just don't generate things over 10,000 hertz because that costs money. And so you buy these ringtones and people were fooling themselves that they could hear their phones going off when the speakers and the phones were incapable of producing the frequency in the first place. It's think like most things that have to do with cell phones. And the internet. Anyway. All right. Uh, where are we? Oh, power is the same. So you're going to see homework problems where they're saying a sound happened at some decibel level. And somebody 100 meters away, what's the sound, what's the intensity they hear? Well, what's the same between those two points? The power. If you can find the power of the first sound, you know the power at the second sound. And then you can recompute the intensity based on the distance. So just power stays the same, intensity changes. So let's do, let's do, let's do an example. Maybe. Computer will let me. Okay. Um, Let's, let's do a quiz first. It's too quick. I keep not putting the... My template is screwed up or something. There, I'll do that for now. Hmm. Hour 10, what happened? Uh, the answer is, is you use those um, conversion equations I told you. And remember, you're going after, you want to work in watts per square meter whenever possible. Because that's the linear thing. If you're working in decibels, you're going to get messed up no matter what happens. So let's do, let's do an example, right? Let's do this one, right? And uh, so we've got a sound of 50 decibels. And then another sound happens at a higher decibel level. And we're going to add the sound intensities together. We want the, we want the total sound intensity 
that you are experiencing. You want to take a guess before we actually go and do the math? Just like guess what the intensity is going to be in decibels. So we're starting with a 50 and then a 70 comes along. What's the new intensity? One million, ten thousand. One million, in decibels. One hundred? Ninety-five. Ninety-five? Seventy-one? Why did you say seventy-one? Okay, won't be a hundred and twenty. Which would be 70 plus 50, right? Because it's a decimal scale, it's a logarithmic scale. It doesn't add that way. How do we have to add? In watts per square meter. So we have to convert these sounds. So we've got to find the intensity of the 50 decibel sound. Well, I have an equation for that, don't I? It was, I don't remember what the equation is anymore. I naught times the log of. No, times 10 to the decibel divided by 10, right? So that's uh, 10 to the minus 12 times 10 to the 5, because it's 50 divided by 10. So this is 10 to the minus 7. All right? Do the same thing for the 70 decibel sound. 10 to the minus 12 times 10 to the 7 is going to be equal to 10 to the minus 5, isn't it? And what are the units on these things? They're watts per square meter, because we've converted them from decibels into watts per square meter. All right, now I can add these two together. My total sound intensity will be the intensity of the 50 plus the intensity of the 70. Well. I'm going to get just a little bit clever with powers of tens here, okay? This, the 50 decibel sound is 0 0.01 times 10 to the minus 5. It's 10 to the minus 7, right? But that's equal to 0 0.01 times 10 to the minus 5. And the reason I did that is because now I want to add on 1 times 10 to the minus 5. For a total of 1.01 .01 times 10 to the minus 5 watts per square meter. I'm just, again, I, I wanted to be able to add without using my calculator. So I just, I played with the d location of the decimal point, right, in the powers of 10. All right, now I've got to convert that number in watts per square meter back into decibels. So we found the total intensity in watts per square meter, even though my font apparently is screwing up. And now I want to find it in decibels. So how do I get that intensity back into decibels? I've got to use my convert, I've got to use my equation, right? The decibels is equal to 10 log i over i naught, which is 10 log of 1.01, 1 1.01 times 10 to the minus 5, all over 1 times 10 to the minus 12. This I cannot do in my head. I have to go get a calculator for it. And the answer is 70.04 decibels. Pretty good guess, Jessica. Why is the sound intensity barely higher than the 70 decibel sound? It's 100 times louder than the 50 decibel sound. So who wins? Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> the louder sound wins. Why are commercials louder than the material you're actually watching the show of? They're trying to sell you something. Trying to get your attention. That, notice, show you're watching ends on some cliffhanger, da da da. Fades to black real quick. There's a millisecond of silence. It's, not, it's more like three-tenths of a second of silence. And then the commercial comes on, and almost every commercial starts the same way. How? Channel. Loud noise, bright colors, fast action. What are those three things doing? Grabbing your attention. 
You are designed to listen to a change. Because if the sound changes, if the movement changes, or the color changes, the tiger is coming out of the grass for you. And we all represent the successful 0.00001% of people that did not get eaten all the way through our genetic legacy. All right. So be careful with decibels, right? It's a logarithmic scale. You just got to convert back and forth. Trust the equations to keep you sane. I don't remember what this is. The worldwide effects aren't oh. just the tsunami as well. If you look at this sequence, you can jip. This was the explosion, uh, the eruption of the volcano uh, in uh, Tonga uh, last year. Okay, um, They were able to track the sound wave as it went around the world. The worldwide effects aren't just the tsunami as well. If you look at this sequence, you can just about make out uh, like a sound wave, a pressure wave moving outward. I think that's a pressure wave. It's moving at roughly the right speed. So this, I specifically looked in the near infrared because that seemed to bring out the effects of the pressure. And that pressure wave has been tracked all the way around the world. Obviously, like nearby, people could hear. Like in Fiji, 1,000 kilometers away, people could hear it. In New Zealand, 3,000 kilometers away, people could hear it. There are reports of people hearing it in Alaska. And of course, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, they have a network of microphones designed to detect nuclear tests. And they found it. I'm sure they will give, tell us just exactly how powerful this event was. But the pressure wave is sufficiently low frequency and deep enough to show up on just regular weather stations. This is the weather at uh, Half Moon Bay Airport showing it. And this is all the weather stations in Japan. And if you play the readings over time, you can see a pressure wave crossing the country. That scale, by the way, is hectopascals. One hectopascal is about one thousandth of the pressure of CFC level. Similarly, in the US, you can see a pressure wave crossing towards the northeast, just taking pressure data at 15 minute intervals. Again, we're living in Star Trek. <laughs> A volcanic eruption in the middle of the Pacific Ocean can be heard that far away. How loud was that noise? Really loud. The loudest noise that we think ever occurred on the surface of planet Earth, or at least when humans were around to listen to it, um, was the um, uh, Krakatoa explosion, thank you, um, that took place in Indonesia in the uh, late 1800s. Okay? It was the explosion that brought on the Little Ice Age, which brought on the potato famines, which brought on a lot of emigration to the United States, all those different kinds of things. But that sound, okay, they estimated it was at the threshold of pain well beyond like a thousand kilometers away from the actual explosion of the volcano, right? Um, and then, I don't remember what that picture was. Oh, that was just the end of this video. Okay, so, Sound is amazing, right? And um, we're gonna tr we're gonna transition a little. I spent a little bit too much time. Let me do the Doppler effect really quick. I think I can do this really quick. At least nail out the uh, the um, concept of it for you. So this is a trumpet playing a sound, right, and a human being listening to that sound. We can see the waves sort of spreading out evenly in all directions. And this is if the source of sound and the person listening to the sound aren't moving relative to each other. If we move the trumpet, though, while it's making the sound, what do you notice about the sound waves in front of the trumpet? Sort of piling up on each other, aren't they? They're closer together. Now, these represent wave fronts coming out, sort of peaks coming out. And the peak-to-peak -peak distance, right, would be the wavelength. Well, can you tell me about the frequency of the sound that this person is hearing in front of the trumpet compared to behind the trumpet? It's higher. It's higher. The Doppler effect is this effect where a sound's frequency is shifted 
because of relative motion. Here's what happens when the trumpet moves away from the person listening to it. Do right? you see how the waves are being spread out because of the motion of that trumpet? Um, so the person is going to hear a frequency that is lower. I'm going to demonstrate the Doppler effect here for you with this buzzer that I've got attached to a string. Okay, so got, I've got a 9-volt battery and a buzzer that's glued to it, and I've got this. It's not very pleasant, right? Anybody want to give me $20 to stop? <laughs> it's just sitting there. You hear one tone, right? Okay? When it's in motion, you heard it go from high to low. Wham, 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 right? That's the Doppler effect. You're hearing a higher frequency as it moves towards you, and then as it moves away from you, you hear the lower frequency. Uh, out here on uh, Blackstone and McKinley, uh, some cars have trouble with their mufflers, I've noticed. Um, and they'll, they'll come zooming by, right? And it'll be this... You have to practice that, by the way. <laughs> that shift in frequency is a Doppler shift. High frequency to low frequency, right? Moving towards you, moving away. Your book, I'm just going to warn you right now, your book, all physics books, really screwed this up and make it much harder than it needs to be. So let me show you what I do. Okay, this is a departure from your book. This is something that I do because I, I don't like having four equations or eight equations or whatever many they give you in this section. It's just ridiculous. Okay? There's one equation for the top that really is. Okay? And that equation is that whatever the observed frequency is, so this is what, what is heard by the observer, is caused by the source frequency, the thing making the sound, multiplied by a factor. And that factor is V, the speed of sound in whatever medium this is, plus the velocity of the observer, divided by the speed of sound, minus the velocity of the source. I'll spell it out for you. Source. Source. Ugh, can't spell that one. It's too small. Okay. This is it. That's the only equation you need if you are careful about direction. It's not a vector. Well, it is a vector. But you don't have to worry about vectors. You're not going to do any components or anything like that. Can you look at the hat? Or these students might have trauma if they get that We have to be worried about towards and away. What is the source and what is the observer doing? Is it moving towards or away from each other? Let me give you, basically, this, this is how I do it in my head, but you could probably do something similar, okay? I, I make a little sort of a mini spreadsheet, okay? Where I've got velocity of, of the observer, velocity of the source, and then I've got towards and away. And basically, if something is trying to get closer to another object, you give it a positive direction. And if it's moving away, you give it a negative sign. I'm kind of visual, so I like having a little spreadsheet in my mind. You can probably just say, oh, towards is positive, away is negative. That works fine too. Right? So that's the total amount of mathematics that you really need to have to pull off any Doppler effect equation as long as you're willing to be careful about direction that things are moving. What do I mean by that? Let me pull up this example right here, okay? And uh, we're not going to have time to finish out all the math, but we can set up the four, the four different scenarios that can be happening. 
in this situation. We are moving at 25 meters per second and ambulance is moving at 40, okay? All possible cases of the ambulance moving towards or away from you. So for example, um, we could be moving north on, say, the freeway on 41, right? And the ambulance, so here's the observer, here's the source. The ambulance could be in front of us and moving towards us. Although it probably wouldn't be on that side of the road, hopefully. It would be over there, right? Okay, so that's one. Um, then there could be a situation, again, where we're still moving north, but it's past us, still moving south. There could also be a situation where we are moving, again, to the north, but the ambulance is behind us and catching up. Oh, I wanted that to be in blue. And then there could be a situation where, we're, again, we're moving north, but the ambulance has passed us moving north. So these represent the entire set of possibilities when it comes to a source and an observer moving to, towards or away from each other. And I could just flip our direction to be south and then all the other directions and we'd end up with the same four cases. Or we could do them horizontally. It doesn't matter. It's the grand total. In the red, is the observer moving towards the source of sound? So VO would be positive in that equation I gave you. The source, is it moving towards or away from the source of sound? It's moving towards. So in our equation, we would put 2,500 hertz. 343 plus 25, all over 343 minus a positive 40. And we would go and calculate what the frequency is. Okay, in the green, is the observer moving towards or away from the source? It's moving away. So we would make it negative 25. And the source, is it moving towards or away? It's moving away. Its direction is away from the observer. And so we would give that a negative 40. In our equation, let's leave these Vs as Vs. That would be V plus a minus 25 all over a V minus a minus 40. Do you see how you have to be careful with your signs? Okay. Down here in the blue, is the observer moving towards or away? It's, the observer here is moving away. Look at its vector. It's trying, don't worry about whether it's getting closer or further apart. Look at what they're trying to do. This one's trying to get away, minus 25. And what about the source? It's moving towards. And for the purple, the observer moving towards or away from the source. It's pointed towards it. It's trying to get closer. So this would be positive 25, and the source is moving away at negative 40. And you'll get all these different frequencies depending on what's happening. Sorry I ran out of time to calculate the numbers there for you. But if you, if you go with the equation I gave you, and then you're just careful about towards and away, you don't have to have four different equations to figure out the number. All right, we will, um, I'll see you tomorrow in lab. And then we're going to finish up chapter 17 on Wednesday so that we can review on Monday. We're just on Tuesday. Why is the first test class so bad?